Okay, everybody, so I can see now that we are a few minutes past the hour. We've got a few folks still joining us, but uh, let's go ahead and get started so we can keep to our timeline here. Um, my name is uh, Jason Thompson. I'm the Director of Global Marketing for SSH Communication Security. And I'd like you uh, to welcome you to today's webinar uh, entitled, It Could Be Happened to You, APT the Mask, also known as Coretto, uh, targets the keys to the kingdom. So let's go over our agenda for today very briefly. Um, four main points in this webinar, four main sections. Just want to go over the mask a little bit. There's a lot of information out there on the on the web, and they're still sort of learning more about the uh, the malware, what exactly it does, and, and how it does it, and who did it. Um, and I would kind of refer you out to, to that for some detailed information um, and ongoing information. You can also monitor our blog because we're actually blogging about this quite frequently. Um, so first, of course, we'll go through about the mask. Then we'll touch on dangerous gaps in your security architecture, things that you think you might be have covered and in reality don't really have covered. The anatomy of an attack, how uh, the mask and other malware or uh, malicious insiders actually execute an attack using uh, encrypted environments, uh, encrypted channels, secure shell keys, etc. And then what you can do about it. So first, let's do a little background on the mask. It was uncovered in February of 2014 by Kaspersky. It was active for about seven plus years with 380 plus known victims in 31 countries. So fairly, a fairly long time that it was out there. For as sophisticated as it was, it only hit 380 known victims, uh, although across a large number of countries. It was a targeted attack. So they targeted specific government institutions, uh, diplomatic uh, organizations, embassies, energy, oil, gas, private companies, research institutions, private equity, uh, activists, a whole whole different slew of folks were targeted. Um, not sure exactly why folks are targeted and others aren't, uh, and not 100% sure yet in, in the, exactly what those exploits resulted in. Uh, but we do know that these systems are compromised. Kaspersky has confirmed that. Uh, in many cases, these were their own customers. Um, and, and so this was a, a fairly uh, targeted uh, deep attack versus a broad, uh, broad attack. Why the mask itself is so dangerous and unique? Uh, well, it's a very advanced attack. One in how it targets, uh, it targeted the the companies, organizations that they're going after. How sophisticated sophisticated the delivery mechanism was, using basically a phishing attack, landing them on a malicious web page, having them click a link which downloaded the malware onto their computer. That malware then consisted of a rootkit and a boot kit which helps conceal the masks so that you could easy, easily find this uh, program in operation. This is why it went undetected for so long. It also targeted, even though the, the footprint of what it was going after, the target area, what it was going after, uh, wasn't thousands and thousands of organizations, uh, it did target multiple operating systems inside the organizations that it did go after, such as 32 and 64-bit Windows versions of operating systems, Mac OS X, Linux, and possibly versions of Android, iPad, and iPhone. So this meant they were going deep inside the organization as, a, as opposed to a broad attack. Uh, and that's really what we're seeing more and more in these advanced persistent threats, uh, where they're trying to gather as much information from a specific target, uh, wait for a date, and then exploit. They also went after over 50 file types. So that includes Word doc, PowerPoint, uh, PDF. OK, those things seem, seem like that would, could be dangerous if it gets out in the wrong hands. Uh, but this also targeted. Uh, SSH keys, uh, VPN, uh, RDP files, etc. So it was de designed to exploit uh, the network traffic, keystrokes, Skype, Skype conversations, PGP, Wi-Fi traffic, mobile devices, screen capture file operations, a whole slew of things that it was designed to exploit. And of course, when we get into these really critical uh, file types and systems information, such as encryption keys, VPN connections, the SSH keys, and RDP files, then, of course, we can see that they're going in for something more than just an information um, you know, drive-by. They're actually, if they can execute an attack and gather this information, they're going to be able to dive much deeper into the organization and get into the really critical information assets. Uh, as most folks know, uh, SSH keys and RDP uh, gives access to really critical systems information with all kinds of information from IPR to credit card information. 
So what if it happened to you? So the mask and other advanced threats that target these encryption keys, they're on the rise. We're seeing a lot more of it uh, out there. And if you aren't prepared, the results can be potentially devastating. Coupled with a lack of security intelligence or visibility inside the encrypted networks, uh, the risk to your business can increase exponentially if you are targeted by uh, an attack like this. That includes the, the obvious things, theft of customer data, the loss of intellectual property, ongoing impacts on business continuity, uh, damage to the brand reputations, fines and lawsuits, and existential threat uh, to the business, meaning that potentially it could put the business under. And that's, that has happened before, not, not in a while, but it has happened before where a business gets attacked and it does actually cause the business to shut its door. So we learned a little bit about the mask here. Folks have probably heard about the mask, read about the mask, uh, seen that it was targeting SSH keys and other really important parts of the infrastructure, different types of files in the environment and network traffic. But there's also been other attacks targeting Secure Shell. In November of 2013, Focator uh, was found by semantic researchers and they discovered a backdoor. Uh, it targets the Linux operating system and is capable of stealing login credentials from Secure Shell connections. Uh, attackers could have accessed the encryption key that secured the unnamed organization's internal communications. So there's another example of an advanced persistent attack or advanced persistent threat making into the organization and trying to go deep by gaining access to the Secure Shell keys. Insider attacks also are on the rise. We know of the June 2013 Edward Snowden attack vector uh, or, or attack on, on the NSA. Whether your politics on this fall on, on, on this issue is somewhat irrelevant. What we're talking about here is if this actually were to happen to you um, and your organization where you had an insider who decided to uh, share internal information, internal company documents, that could be quite devastating for the organization. And there was another issue, uh, not as high on the radar, obviously, uh, another insider attack where a former hostgator employee used an SSH key. They basically deployed that through across 2,700 servers and potentially put thousands of customers' websites at risk. He even had those keys in his possession and ready to deploy even after he was terminated from the company. So why the mask and other attack, attack vectors targeting encrypted networks? Why are they so alarming? Secure Shell provides access to critical information assets through, throughout the organization. So this means all kinds of servers, processes, uh, application to application connectivity, remote access from uh, third-party workers working inside of your environment to internal employees who are accessing servers throughout the system or throughout the environment. When Secure Shell isn't managed or controlled, this can allow malicious insiders to attack critical information assets. It can also allow, in the case of a advanced persistent threat or malware that's targeting your organization, to compromise a or steal basically a Secure Shell key and compromise that identity. And that compromised identity then can gain access to the environment uh, without really um, the security intelligence operations in the organizations knowing what's going on because encryption blinds security ops and forensics teams or your SEM to what's going on in the environment. Unless you're catching it at the end point, you, you're going to have a real tough time identifying the malicious activity. And in addition to this, some of the defenses that you think you have in place, such as firewalls and other policy tools and restrictions, uh, encryption actually is an end run around that because you're not able to uh, apply policy, especially on a content basis, uh, inside the encrypted networks. And that creates a security risk. You may not even know that you're being attacked. You may not know that there is actually a uh, compromised identity inside of your environment. So we also know that encrypted channels provide direct access to the treasure chest. And here I want to kind of point out some information that Visa released back in 2011 where they were talking about uh, remote access continuing to be one of the most frequent attack methods uh, used by intruders to gain access to merchant point of sale environment. Uh, they talk about SSH specifically as one of the remote access solutions that are oftentimes used as well as visually driven packages which oftentimes still use the SSH protocol. And how remote management applications come with an inherent level of risk. Obviously you sometimes need them to operate in your business. Uh, but they create a virtual backdoor for unauthorized access. Uh, and PCI, of course, wants these to be configured and controlled according to PCI uh, industry data security uh, standards. The exploitation of improperly configured remote management software tools is a method of attack most frequently used by attackers against POS payment systems. Now, 
keep in mind I pointed out that this was uh, something issued, uh, a directive issued or an alert issued by Visa in 2011. If you look uh, to the right of the screen there, you'll see an article from Information Week looking at how target, the target breach involved an HVAC, HVAC contractor system uh, able to, or an HVAC contractor that was able to uh, get inside the environment through uh, remote access that they were permitted to have, and then of course that being the source of the compromise. So we can see that remote access is still an issue. It's been a known issue for a long time. Uh, we know that there's the advanced persistent threats out there such as uh, the mask that are seeking to utilize these encrypted networks to both access the systems as well as exfiltrate data. And we know that there's been significant risks and issues and uh, these have not been reduced, these have not been remediated in some of the largest organizations in the world. So one of the things we come across a lot is folks saying, I thought we had this covered. But what most organizations don't realize is they have dangerous gaps in their security and intelligence architecture, or their security architecture in general. Many organizations have deployed privilege identity management solutions that uh, cover most interactive human users or identities inside the environment. But what most organizations don't realize is that makes up only about 20% of the identities that operate inside the environment. The other 80% of, of identities are machine-to-machine -machine, uh, driven identities. And in one customer case we had about 20,000 hosts, we found that about 90% of all uh, identities in the environment were actually machine-to-machine -machine versus uh, human interactive users. In general, what we found is, is that most organizations lack sufficient access controls continuous monitoring of DLP or forensics capabilities inside the M2M networks. In many cases, M2M authentications, as I said, outnumber the interactive authentications. As well, these M2M communications and connections can be hijacked by interactive users. Uh, M2M communications often carry high-value payloads, such as credit card numbers and other personal identifiable information, which is why they are oftentimes the target of advanced persistent threats like the mask. And M2M encrypted communications are rarely monitored and the encryption used to protect the data blinds security ops and forensics teams, as I said. So many organizations think, hey, I've got this covered, I've got a jump post, all of my um, sysadmins or third-party remote users, they all have to go through this jump host server where I can monitor all their keystrokes, I can replay all this information, I've got a, a little forensic fall where I can tie this in to my security intelligence architecture by throwing my syslogs up to the SEM, until you realize suddenly that, wow, I don't have access control for uh, many of these end-to-end -end communications, this is what these advanced persistent threats are going after. That's why they're targeting the SSH keys. The SSH keys are used by interactive users, but they're also used by machine-to-machine -machine identities because machines obviously can't log in. To go into a little more detail on end-to-end -end identities, uh, just understand the, the vast number of interactive uh, authentications that are out there um, and the fact that they're rarely monitored. And those two things are, are really critical. We've also got on our website a forestry report. It's available on our website. Actually, the, the front page banner on our white paper section, you can find the forestry report. It's on the rise of IT automation and the new security imperatives. This is really focusing on uh, secure shell and secure shell used as a component of the Internet of Things, as a component of critical business applications, a component of uh, remote access of the extended enterprise. And I want to share a couple uh, findings from that report with you. I'm not going to go into deep a deep dive into that, that's its own webinar, but I do encourage you to download this off the website. One is what organizations, organizations rely on SSH for numerous processes. So you can see here on the left, they rely on it for securing automated uh, transfer of data, administrator access, VPN, secure their WAN, uh, secure machine-to-machine -machine, uh, transactions, enabling automated processes to initiate regular backups, data center management and automation, etc. And when you look at, when we ask the question, how important is SSH secure shell to your organization, 82% of respondents said their organization uses SSH, and 68% consider SSH as important or critical to the business. So that's a fairly large number of people who say they use it, and also that it's critical to the business. So it sort of belies the fact that uh, many organizations also say, uh, they are not monitoring and logging SSH activities, and only 44% indicate that they have visibility into how many SSH keys are deployed into their environment and for what those authorizations are used for. 
So based on our real world experience, most organizations only have visibility into interactive user acti activities. That really highlights the challenge of having this 90% of the organization not covered. This is where the real risk of something like uh, the mask or Corrado or any of these other uh, advanced persistent threats that are targeting SSH keys, that are specifically targeting your organization, trying to get deep into the environment, or what these ins malicious insiders are able to do inside the environment. Because the environment's not monitored and managed, it's creating a, a, a significant risk. And if you were to visit our In the News page on the website, you'll see a growing awareness of the problem from all kinds of organizations and magazines, such as Newsweek, SC Magazine, Forbes, across the board, as well as a, a bunch of new customers that we've taken on board because they realize that this risk is really, really critical, not just from the standpoint of them failing compliance audits, which is now happening at a more regular pace, but also the overall security challenges that they're facing. So let's briefly look at the anatomy of an attack. Let's look at what happens when a uh, malicious insider or an advanced persistent threat or attacker uh, compromises an SSH key. And let's see what actually can happen. These are real world cases. This can happen to any organization that is not controlling uh, deployment access to their secure shell environment through uh, centralized key management and that is not monitoring their encrypted channels. The basics, obviously, attacker accesses the servers with an, with an authorized key and the attacker extracts that informa those information assets through the encrypted tunnel. And of course, you don't really know who that is because they've used the SSH key to spoof the identity and then of course they can exfiltrate that data out unmonitored using uh, the encrypted channel and out they go with the information. You may not even know that the attack occurred. Step one for the attacker, gain access. So there are several methods an attacker can use to gain access to your secure shell environment. If it's an interactive user account that they're compromising, they would obviously go after the username and password. They could also use password theft, social engineering brute force. Uh, compromise key and passphrase, which is also going to be an interactive user. These are a little bit more difficult because there's oftentimes two-factor authentication or there's a key and a passphrase that must be entered. The one that's probably the, the easiest for the, the hacker to go after is going to be the compromised key. And this, of course, is making up the, the majority of the traffic or the majority of the identities inside the environment. Uh, this is most likely the target of these advanced persistent threats because they're looking for uh, a key that oftentimes can use transitive trust to bounce throughout the environment. Uh, a single key sometimes uh, grants access to a large swath of the environment, sometimes uh, hundreds or even thousands of servers in the environment, especially in legacy environments where uh, best practices were not, never put in place for uh, proper key management deployment rotation. If you look at what a key is, it's basically a, a pretty simple thing. You've got a private key and a public key. And when those match, you gain access. Uh, keys are stored in a simple text file located in a directory on a client and server machine. Uh, an asymmetric public key and private key uh, pair grants access and establishes the secure communication. So it's not necessarily very difficult for uh, an advanced persistent threat targeting SSH keys once they gain access, especially at a root level to a server, to identify the keys and then steal those keys. And of course, once someone has the private key, game over. The keys grant access to systems when the key pairs match, as I said, and the keys are tied to a user, but without proper management and controls, the actual user can be nearly impossible to determine. So this is an advantage for the hacker in that if they actually gain access to that private key, and let's say it's an advanced persistent threat, they've gone in and scraped a bunch of keys out of the environment, it will look like those machines or those identities that are accessing the systems are permitted to do so, so it won't really raise any flags. And based upon the configurations, keys can be used uh, or based upon configuration, key usage can be configured to uh, restrict what commands can be used, establish a whitelist of machines that can use a particular key. This is additional security capabilities uh, and policy restrictions that are available using Secure Shell. Attack Vector 1, exploiting deployed, uh, deployment keys in production environments. So here's what we oftentimes see. This is actually a, a large use case. We see at a number of large customers that we have right now where they think they have something like this with business users only accessing production servers and developers only accessing the test environment. What we oftentimes find is that they're actually, from the test environment, pushing things over to production. And that's allowing business users to sometimes gain access to test environments, developers to gain access to production servers. The whole thing is a mess. And because of this, we've got malicious insiders as well as 
external actors that are bad actors that are able to get inside the environment, compromise a key, and then move throughout different areas of the environment, including disaster recovery, which is oftentimes um, managed through, or, or the connectivity is, is driven through SSH keys, to just move throughout the entire environment. So it's a big mess. We find this all the time. This is a, a, an attack vector that an insider or malicious, malicious uh, external attacker can uh, easily go after. Attack number, vector number two, this is circumventing jump posts. So this goes back to um, all those organizations out there who feel like they've resolved their privilege access management issues uh, because they've got a jump post in place. Well, the first time a, lo a user logs in to the jump post, in many cases, they're able to then access the Unix servers, the Linux servers, whatever it is. Once they've done that, on subsequent log, well, they can deploy the SSH key uh, after they've logged in via the jump host. They can deploy an SSH key inside the servers, and then subsequent logins after that, the user can bypass the jump host and internal security controls using the SSH key. Of course, this is going around the entire point of having the jump host in place. This is something that a uh, malicious insider uh, can easily, easily utilize. Uh, but you can also see how a key that's placed in there and has been compromised could easily be um, utilized by an external attacker uh, to access those servers as well, therefore going around your, your jump post solution. Attack vector number three, circumventing mainframe security. So the same kind of thing. Uh, mainframe is sort of the workhorse here of, of the uh, uh, data center, and uh, many organizations use it because they know that it's rock solid as far as security. Uh, the same kind of issue here where the user can log in to the mainframe via RACF. Uh, the user can access uh, server and upload the public key into the mainframe and then subsequent logins they're able to go around RACF authentication via an SSH key and copy the credentials throughout the mainframe system. Again, because the key is placed here, it doesn't necessarily have to be a user that, that the one person, even though they're not a bad actor, they just deployed a key and maybe shouldn't have. But because this key is now in the IBM mainframe, no one's aware that it's there. It now becomes a potential uh, hack point for the organization because now the external uh, threats can then go through the environment, look for these keys, and attempt to compromise uh, the mainframe environment. So attack vector number four, a lost or stolen key granting privilege to a high level of administrative access. So this is kind of a shocking thing that we kind of see a lot out there that We'll go into an environment, say it's a major banking institution with 15,000 posts. This is a real-world case uh, example, and I'll show you more details on that in a second. Um, where basically they've got 1.5 million keys floating around their environment. So they have more keys than they do employees. And these keys are granting access to the highest level, uh, in many cases, to servers throughout the environment. If one of these keys are lost or stolen, this is what the advanced persistent threats are going after, this key is lost or stolen and it gains access to one server, either through transitive trust or going through and find, actually finding uh, other keys inside of this initial server here. They can then take the keys from this server and then gain access to the next server and on and on and on because over time, say a 10-year period of time where these keys have not been managed, uh, this has led to the, this massive proliferation has led to a huge risk point because um, Basically, there's a lot of keys with high level of privilege that no one knows are there, knows, no one knows what they do, that then the attacker can take and start testing against different servers to gain access. Of course, once they gain access to a wide swath of the environment, they can deploy uh, you know, something like a, a mask, uh, APT, throughout the environment and very quickly do a lot of damage to the overall organization. Step two, of course, would be to deploy the malicious payload. As we, we went through here in step one, the access uh, attack vectors. Once you have gained access to the system, obviously you could deploy your malware, virus, trojans, worms, rootkits, uh, whatever that is. So in the case of Coretto, their methodology was to get people through a phishing attack, uh, to click on a link to a known, or what they thought was a known website. Uh, they click on the link, they download the malware. The malware is now in their system. Now they're looking for SSH keys. Once they uh, grab a hold of an SSH key and they can get inside the environment, they can use what I showed you back here in this, this uh, slide. They could actually bounce from machine to machine very quickly deploying the malware throughout the environment, grabbing 
more information and more information. Now this becomes really critical to understand and, and see the risk when you see they're working across multiple uh, multiple platforms uh, and they're looking for over 50 different file types. So they're they're do, trying to do a deep dive. So if anyone got this deep inside of an organization, it could clearly do uh, a great deal of damage. Of course, they could also install backdoors and bypass authentication. This is something that uh, I just showed you with the jump host bypass authentication. Uh, and they could do data, data damage or destruction uh, to the environment, manipulate the data, change information around. Of course, these are all very dangerous things if they happen inside the environment. It's even more dangerous if it happens in mass in various different areas of the environment. And of course, step three is exfiltration. So once they've gained access to the system, uh, they go inside the environment, they, they, they find the information they want to steal, how do they get it out? Well, because most encrypted mo channels aren't monitored, uh, they can just pull that information out through the secure shell tunnel, either to a, you know, some type of machine they have inside the environment if they're an attacker, or to an external server outside the environment. Oftentimes, firewalls are set to just allow SSH to flow through because it can't see into the SSH encryption anyway. So this is just allowed to flow right out the organization. It's a huge issue because it blinds security operations as to what was taken and by whom. It makes it very difficult for forensics teams to do an investigation, and it slows down remediation and response activities. All right, so we've gone through a little bit of the, the fear, uncertainty, and doubts. Of course, we see these types of things all the time. Security professionals have to sort of prioritize uh, which, which threat they go after next. Uh, obviously, the mask represents a, a significant threat to an organization, particularly if the secure shell keys or other uh, really high-level, high-access granting uh, file types are, are compromised. Uh, what I'm going to show you here is kind of how we solve the problem and help you uh, find a path to prevent, mitigate, and respond to an advanced attack targeting your secure shell environment. So how we solve the problem first, we look at problem scope, then discovery, then we want to lock down the environment so only the central manager, the key manager, can deploy or remove keys, rotate keys. We're going to re remediate the environment, make sure we can, we can get everything uh, cleaned up. We do some mapping to make sure that we don't make any, break any business processes. Uh, we put the environment under management, and then we continuously monitor the environment. And then finally, after we've got the environment set up where we can do this actually at the same time, uh, we put network-based privilege access controls in, in place, or what I like to call advanced privilege access management solutions. Our solution is Crypto Auditor that allows you to go beyond what the traditional privilege access management solutions do, the, the jump hosts, and allow you to see, to actually decrypt the SSH traffic and uh, provide a, a, a in-network uh, uh, access control solutions as well to make sure that files are crossing the network that shouldn't. So one is problem scope. We have a free download available on our website at ssh.com slash SRA. Uh, SRA reports on known and unknown trust relationships, key agent key age and key strengths, uh, private keys over than two years, SSH servers with known vulnerabilities, SSH client and server versions, uh, number of duplicate private keys, private keys not passphrase protected, number of reauthorizations, number of post keys, private and public user keys, and a host of other, other things. Uh, this is a free tool and I encourage everyone to try to use this to at least get a snapshot of part of their environment to get an idea of the scope of the environment. A lot of customers come back to us after using this and say, well, we we knew we had some problem, but we didn't realize it was about 10 or 20x what we thought it was. So this is a great place to start in the process. Once you've identified the problem and you're ready to move forward, the, the first step, of course, is to discover what's in your environment, discover all the existing trust relationships. This requires discovering all user keys that are authorized for login and all private keys. And this must be done for all users and all servers, and correctly also on desktop. Step two in the process is to lock down the environment before enforce approval. So this is the real, what's created the crisis inside of um, you know, the data centers uh, as far as uh, encryption keys. Well, it's because there, there was uh, no centralized control. There was no ability to lock down the environment. So now with uh, solutions like what we have with the Universal SSH Key Manager, you're actually able to lock down the environment, enforce approvals through a centralized process for all key setups and other key operations. Uh, by relocating all authorized keys to a root own directory that is under the control of the key manager. Remediation. So we want to determine which keys are actually used and where the keys are used from. 
one or multiple sources, and we want to remove any orphan keys or keys that are no longer in use. Believe it or not, you go into some pretty uh, secure environments and find keys that have been assigned to people who have been terminated from the uh, organization for sometimes severe, significant reasons. Uh, folks are oftentimes shocked to see the number of keys that are still there from employees or former employees and former contractors, or just keys that were deployed and no one knew that they were deployed or the reason why. So remediating, remediating is very important. At the same time, you don't want to break business processes, so you need to have a tool in place to make sure that when you do this, uh, you can keep those applications running and keep those data transfers going inside the data center so you don't shut down a part of the business while you're trying to clean up your encryption key mess. Management. We want to eliminate manual work, human error, and save costs with automated key creation and key removals. We want to reduce the number of administrators who need to have access and control privilege. We rotate every authorized key and corresponding identity key to time limit the risk posed by compromised or copied keys, and control where each key can be used from and what commands can be executed using the key. And from the key management side, continuous monitoring. So we want to continuously monitor the environment to detect, detect any unauthorized key operations occurring outside the key manager, and generate alerts and enforce SSH software versions and configurations, and prevent users from installing SSH server software. I want to talk a little bit too about this is our crypto auditor solution. We provide network-based privilege access controls. Um, there's of course more information available on our website as I realize we're getting towards the 30-minute mark of the presentation. Um, with crypto auditor network-based privilege access controls, we provide really an advanced privilege access control solution that goes beyond the traditional jump host only model. Um, we utilize encrypted channel monitoring to continuously monitor SSH, SFTP, and RDP traffic, and soon SSL and uh, TLS support will be added to that. Uh, we're one of the, unique in that uh, we actually uh, connect or, or enable DLP and security intelligence solutions by uh, connecting through an ICAP feed or by throwing our syslogs up to our SEM. Uh, and that actually extends the value of those DLP solutions to uh, your encrypted traffic as well. So in real time, we can actually stop data loss uh, inside the organization or inside the network. Privilege access controls, uh, we centralize, we have, we can control what subchannels are available via SSH, stop port forwarding, prevent unauthorized VPN connections, and restrict destinations. In forensics, Vault, in case of an exploit does occur, we can actually go back in time, do a search, um, look in the Vault, and actually replay what activity took place by the identity, and that can be used in a court of law or that can be used to actually remediate against a, an attack. Here's kind of an overview of what network-based what network controls look like. So if you look at the top here, you've got, and this works across, this is what's interesting about this too, it works in a cloud environment because it works at the network level. It works with third-party administrators or contractors here, remote administrators. It also works in a BYOD environment and in instances where people are accessing SSH uh, through their own iPads or iPhones or home computers. Uh, basically, by channeling all this uh, SSH, SFTP, and RDP traffic uh, through Crypto Auditor, what we call the Hound, we can actually apply contextual awareness to the traffic that's crossing the network. We can decide to hold that traffic. We can decide to deny that traffic, or we can decide to allow that traffic to continue on. We can integrate, as I said before, with our DLP and SIM uh, solutions, and then we can store that information in the Crypto Auditor Vault so that you can go back later if there is a, is a breach of some kind and actually do a, a deep dive into what the administrator or identity was doing. And of course, the track that you want to have access, you can still grant access. Uh, one of the, the, the key things here, too, is we do provide uh, these advanced network access controls where you can actually control, for instance, a key would give access to uh, administrator to access one of these Windows servers down here. But let's say you didn't want those administrators to be able to download those files, you could actually block those types of commands using crypto auditors. So there's additional network-based uh, access control capabilities that crypto auditor provides that really is why we call this an advanced privilege access uh, management solution. And success proves neat. So over the past few few years since we deployed these or, or built these products two years ago and started deploying these in, in major enterprises, uh, we've su successfully uh, onboarded a top five global bank with 
Universal SSH Key Manager, one of the largest rail transportation and logistics companies in the U.S. Uh, the Washington Post, we can name that one, one of the nation's largest media companies, and they've fully really deployed their UKM in their environment. And we've got a bunch of crypto auditor wins. We've got a bunch recently as well. Uh, this is just one of the bigger ones where a major European uh, security depositories organization selected crypto auditor because they needed to monitor and control external application developers and administrators working in their data centers. And just, I, I didn't cover this at the beginning, so we can get right into the presentation, but as all, many of you probably know, SSH Communications, we are the inventors of the SSH protocol. Uh, we're a publicly traded company listed on the NASDAQ OMX in Helsinki. We have 3,000 customers, including six of the 10 largest U.S. banks. Uh, what we do is secure show access control and key management, privilege identity management, and data and transit encryption. So we are the market leader. Our goal is to be, is to be the market leader and develop advanced security solutions to meet today's business security and compliance requirements in encrypted networks. And that's the presentation for today. If anyone has any questions, I'll open up the, uh, the Q&A. And one question is when will the slides be available? Uh, we will send that out to anyone that requests it. Uh, you can email me at jason.thompson at ssh.com or I can, I can see who asked this question. I'll go ahead and have a, one of our SDRs uh, email this over to you after the presentation. All right, so another minute to see if there's any questions. If not, um, thanks for, for joining everybody in today's webinar. And don't forget also, InfoSec World, if you're going to be there down in Orlando, we're at booth number 406, and you can learn more about this. And again, the Forrester um, white paper is on the website, as well as some other great information um, about these issues. Uh, and I encourage you to visit that as well as our blog. All right, everyone, thanks a lot. Have a great day.